So yeah, my name is Christina Lister. I'm a marketing and audience development consultant. Um, I work in particular with museums and heritage organisations and cultural venues from the larger ones like um, the Science Museum Group and Museum of London, but a lot of small and independent ones as well, like Jane Austen's House, uh, Museum of Cambridge, the Havilland Aircraft Museum, um, and everything in between really. So just in terms of what we're going to cover today, um, just really I want it to be an opportunity for you to just reflect a bit on who your audiences are and how you might engage them in a COVID world and kind of beyond post-COVID world really. Um, I'm going to provide a sort of five-step framework for you to use, which you can use when you're reflecting on your audience engagement and development. Also, just share some examples of some of the amazing national sector research that's out there now that's, I think, really useful for audience development planning. Um, and then after the break, we'll talk a bit more about online and offline examples, sort of practical examples I've come across over the last year of what museums have been doing that have stood out for me. Just a range of examples that will hopefully provide some good ideas and inspiration for you. So um, that's also when I'd really love to hear from you, either talking about what your organisations have, have been doing to engage audiences online, offline, um, or also if there are things that you've come across that you'd like to share with the group, that'd be great. Um, and then finally, we'll also just talk on at the end, thinking about reopening, how to reassure and encourage visitors when we are reopening. So in terms of takeaways, hopefully you'll get a bit more of an understanding sort of reflection on who your audiences are and who you'd like them to be um, some clarity on the data you currently hold and what you might need to gather so identifying some gaps that maybe you have um, some tools to think about how you can engage with different audiences and like I said some ideas and inspiration so I, I suppose it's worth starting with a couple of definitions and um, you know, when I'm referring to audiences, I'm thinking very broadly in terms of they could be your visitors, they could be people you're engaging with online, digitally, through social media channels. You know, uh, they could be participants of workshops, uh, viewers, readers, researchers. Um, I'm thinking quite broadly. Um, you may well have your own definition that you use within your organisation. And in terms of audience development, um, Arts Council England, for example, talk about activity undertaken to meet the needs of existing and potential audiences so I think that's um, I've been I've evolving his mind so you know it's important to remember both our current audiences and also potential ones um, and it's really about developing ongoing relationships with them uh, National Lottery Her Heritage Fund you know talking about putting people in the center making an effort I think that's the thing um, we do have to make a bit of an effort it's, people aren't necessarily just going to come to us and engage with us um, thinking about how we can be accessible, inviting, meaningful for them. And this, again, this idea of building ongoing relationships and, and planning and thinking about a sort of longer term approach as well. So we're going to be talking um, slightly about audience development and also about audience engagement today. I haven't come across a sort of universally accepted definition of audience engagement. But like I said, there's definitely um, no right or wrong. I think engagement and audience engagement is quite an overused term, sort of bandied around a lot. Some people really don't like it. Um, I think it's really good just to think a bit about when we're talking about engagement, you know, what, what do we mean? Um, so, for example, if you're running things on social media, are you, are you calling that promotion and marketing? Are you just doing that to entice people to visit? Or actually, is that engagement activity um, in itself? Um, and again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just really worth thinking about what engagement actually means to you and your organisation. I mean, for me, essentially, it's about building relationships with our audiences and really understanding their needs and creating a range of experiences that benefit the audiences, that provide some form of value to them. And it can be something really fleeting, um, perhaps a little chuckle on social media, or it, it can be something a lot more profound, like a deep learning experience, um, something very enjoyable, some stimulation, you know, it can be sort of a whole range of things. So just in terms of providing a bit of context, um, where we are now thinking about both the impact of the last year on our audiences and our organisations. So both counts, um, you know, in, as individuals and as organisations, we've had very varied experiences of the past year. So when we're talking about audiences, you know, it's not, we can't really treat them all the same. Um, some will be eager to return, some will not. Some have never visited us in the past and will still not. Some have never visited us in the past, but actually now might consider it, for example. 
things are obviously changing really rapidly and evolving. Uh, people's attitudes are changing. Um, there's also quite a lot of competition for audiences' attention. There has been competition digitally and online, and now I think that's going to shift to competing for those people who are going to be happy, keen, prepared to get out and about, have days out. Um, you know, we're going to be competing with them. So museums are competing um, with places like, you know, gardens, zoos, um, theme parks, all sorts of outdoor spaces, as well as indoor spaces like shopping centres and cinemas and so on. Um, in terms of our digital game engagement, it's worth just thinking about sort of screen and online fatigue that's set in for many people. And also that it's not a sort of catch-all solution for um, when our doors are closed, because not everyone has access to um, the internet or to devices or the skills um, to use them or interest and motivation, actually. Um, in terms of museums, we've you know, had very varied experiences with the last year. It's really quite hard to plan. So um, we talked yesterday in, in marketing in terms about how can we be agile? And I think the same goes for audience engagement and development. You know, how, how can we be nimble with what we do so we can adapt and adjust if circumstances and regulations change? We've had new, new ways of working, lots of experimentation in the sector, which has been fantastic. Um, the sort of the idea that we need to understand our audiences, I think, is uh, important now more than ever. And in particular, just, you know, needing to read the room. So really understanding what our audiences want from us. There's been a bit of an explosion in data. So both our own from all the stuff we're doing online can be analysed. Lots of um, data um, is provided digitally. Um, and also there's lots of research in the sector, some of which I'll cover today. Um, that can be a bit overwhelming. So I think it's also about identifying what data is important to us and how can we use it. And ultimately, at the end of the day, there's also been a great impact on staff and well-being, uh, volunteer well-being. So we just need to be mindful of that as we reopen and things continue to change. So I'm going to talk you through a sort of five-step framework that you can use if you just want to think um, step by step, um, do some reflection about your audiences. So we're going to start with an audit, uh, move on to research, then planning, acting, and evaluating. Um, you know, it's it's quite a sort of standard um, project planning framework, really. So first of all, thinking about the audit, I think it's really interesting to take a step back and reflect on whether 2020, the past 12 months, COVID-19, and everything else has fundamentally changed your audiences who follow you, who are engaged with you. So. If you think back, you know, who were your pre-COVID audiences and who were your pre-COVID target audiences? So you'll have had audiences who were already engaging with you and perhaps you had some on a target list. So they weren't engaging with you either at all or in great numbers, but they were the ones you wanted to reach. So are, are they the same now? So have you reached new audiences? Have some of your older audiences, um, and I don't mean that by age, so have some of your pre-COVID audiences dropped off? Have you lost them along the way? Um, and who do you want to target in the future? So just, just having a bit of think about that. Um, you can also do a bit of a sort of checklist then, thinking about um, what you know about those audiences. So this is just an example. You can tweak it, you can tailor it, um, you know, sort of add to it. But you might want to set out all your different target audience groups and your core audience groups you reach. Do a bit of a summary of who they are, Consider how you've normally pre-COVID engaged with them, whether you've done anything in the past year to engage them, if you know whether they're likely to want to visit anytime soon, what they need in place before booking or before visiting. Um, can you identify what their barriers to engagement or barriers to participation might be? Thinking then about how you're going to reach them, what they might need or want from you now, and also across maybe the next year or two, how you can meet those needs. And then it's absolutely fine if you can't answer some of those questions because that's part of the audit process really is to identify where those gaps are. So what is it that you don't know? And are there things that you can take some, undertake some research in or look at some sector research to try to find out to plug those gaps? So here's just an example um, that's made up. So for example, your target audience group might be local families, um, so you provide a bit more detail on that. Um, they're within a 10 mile radius, uh, primary school aged children. So pre-COVID, you know, you might engage them with interactives, trails, dressing up, workshops, activities, that sort of thing. 
in the past year, you might have done some online educational sessions for them, created some self-guided trails around the local town, perhaps. Previously, they used to visit and return weekends and school holidays, primarily. Um, some returned in the past summer. What do they need before booking a visit? They want reassurance it'd be safe and still fun and understanding of what's changed as well. What are their barriers? So perhaps anxiety. Um, they might also be anxious about some of the younger children touching things. They might currently feel overwhelmed by all the online resources, um, screen fatigue, you know, previously maybe overwhelmed by homeschooling, now sort of slightly digesting the shift um, back to schooling, perhaps potentially also redundancies impacting their household income. So how you can reach them, maybe you have a family newsletter, maybe you have a Facebook page, for example. What do they want and need from you now? Actually, not very much because you've done some research and you think some might be interested in visiting, but others have enough on their plates. Um, and what they're likely to need and want from you in the next year or two, and that's maybe something that you don't know. So that in the last column, there might be something you want to do a bit of research to find out about. So like I said, just, you know, just consider what you know about your audiences, the likelihood that they might return, what their barriers might be, um, think about if there are groups that you haven't been engaging with, you should be, you want to think about their needs and, you know, just identify if you have gaps, both in what you know, but also maybe gaps in your programming and provision for those target audiences you want to reach. So then once you have identified those gaps, if you have any gaps to fill, that's when, you know, it'd be useful to undertake a bit of research. So in terms of planning some research, if you want to do some yourself, Start with a question. So what is it you want to know? Why do you want to know that? And how are you going to use that insight? You know, only go to the trouble because it takes time, sometimes budget, to do some research if it's genuinely something that you're going to use. Then think about the capture. So what data do you need? Where and how are you going to get this? And I'll book you through a few examples um, shortly. Then you get the data, the insights. What does that all tell you? You know, what, what, what um, are the results of your research? And then at you know the bit that can be forgotten about so how will you use those insights are you going to do anything differently are you going to change anything who needs to see the research who can you share it with so these are just a few examples of sort of research data consultation that you can undertake yourselves um, you know if you are going to be asking people to pre-book or if you did last year if you reopened then you could look at booking data um, you can obviously do audience surveys as and when people return. You could even undertake some visitor observation, maybe to see how people are moving around your spaces, any areas they're avoiding. Also, if there are any areas that may be bottlenecks, that sort of thing. Um, online surveys, looking at website and social media analytics. Um, even if you can't reach lots of individuals, if there are maybe community groups or stakeholders, um, it could be anything from local community groups, you know, a leader of, it could be a head teacher, it could be a leader of um, Scouts or Brownies, group five. it could be someone um, from your local tourist information organisation, that sort of thing, um, who will have a lot of expertise and, you know, just through one email or phone call, you'll get a lot of insights, hopefully. Um, some organisations have been doing online focus groups really successfully, um, potentially in the future, there'll be the option of going back to in-person ones. Even something as simple as a social media poll or asking your followers questions on social media just to get a little bit of light touch feedback can be useful. Uh, if you're doing outreach packs, um, you can include a hard copy survey in those, ideally with a stamp stressed envelope or similar. Um, and also, if you really don't have the time or the budget um, or, or the skills or confidence, whatever it might be, then there's um, a lot of research that's being shared in the sector that you can also get look at which I will share now as well. So these are just a few screen grabs of a few research reports. So this is from the audience agency. They looked at um, data from organisations that reopened. So August to October uh, last year and compared that with um, the data from people who were visiting in the same time period the year before. Um, so some of you might be familiar with their audience spectrum segmentation approach. So um, for those of you who are not, basically they um, split the population into these 10 or 11 groups or segments, which largely have similar sort of within the groups, those people have similar attitudes to 
culture and heritage and engage with those in sort of similarish ways. Often they also share some sort of other demographics or lifestyle attributes. So um, commuter lands culture buffs, for example, typically live within commuting distance of bigger cities. Um, trips and treats tend to be families who um, like just to go out to culture and heritage more as a sort of day out entertainment. They like panto, those sorts of things. Um, so the, the groups on the left are the ones who typically most culturally engaged, uh, metroculturals, commuter land culture buffs, experience seekers, and then the four groups, the three in the middle, sorry, dormitory dependables, trips and treats, um, home and heritage, they're sort of mid range. And the ones on the right are the ones that typically, as you can see by the percentages, aren't um, as culturally engaged as the other segments. So it's interesting, the, the purpley figures relate to performing arts venues and the pinky, um, pinky uh, graphs um, blocks, they relate to museums and galleries. So it's interesting to see sort of who returned and certainly Metro Culturals and Experience Seekers, which two of the groups that are, you know, really love and breathe culture and heritage. And um, it's such an integral part of who they are and they're slightly more open maybe to new experiences. You know, they were sort of really keen to come back last summer. Um, so Alva has also been tracking public sentiment. So Alva is the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions, um, but their, their, their surveys relate to sort of, um, organisations, I think, of any size, really. So they have been tracking public sentiment, attitudes to returning to venues and their attitudes to COVID-19 and risk since, I think, April last year. Um, so this was their sixth wave of research from January, and they've just announced that I think next week their next wave of research is out. Um, so look out for the findings of that because things are changing very quickly. Um, but they found, for example, their research that the groups that were most likely to return, you know, the soonest last year were younger people. So you can see here 16 to 34 year olds, um, groups with children, families with children, and also members of organisations. Um, now, this is from Scotland, but I just thought, again, it's just an example of some really interesting research that's out there. Benefits of online engagement during lockdown. So people who engaged with museums online during lockdown um, were asked what the benefits were for them. And so it's just a really nice example. If you don't have the data yourself, you know, just to see what else is out there. So things like, you know, it made me look forward to going back there. I was impressed they wanted to keep audiences engaged. This is something I hear a lot and actually goes, I think, beyond um, the museums and heritage sector. I think across the board over the last year, there have been some organisations that have really um, kind of pulled up their socks and just been there for their audiences or been there for their communities, whoever they are. And um, I think there's a lot of goodwill and um, loyalty now to those organisations because people felt actually you had my back when times were really tough um, and you went above and beyond. So I think that's really encouraging for a lot of museums that have been able to do some engagement over the last year. I think that, you know, that has really opened the doors to both new audiences and also just deeper relationships between some visitors or audiences and those uh, museums. Um, the audience agency has also be, uh, published some research which they're calling their cultural participation monitor and again that should be updated. So on the left just an example which shows what types of activities people were participating in. Again if you haven't done very much or if maybe you're considering what you might continue to do digitally over the next couple of years you might want to look at this sort of data to see okay what are the things that are most popular generally with people. Um, and on the right, again, that uses the audience agency's um, segmentation approach. Um, I think what's really interesting there is that there's a split in um, who prefers to sort of watch performances and events, slightly more passive um, experience online, and who's really, so that's sort of the, generally the sort of mid um, culturally engaged groups. But then looking at, I think what's really interesting is looking at the sort of participatory activities, the, the kind of craft workshops and those sorts of things, which is the purple blocks in the, in the graph on the right. So metro culturals and experience seekers who are culturally engaged and really interested in trying new experiences, you might expect them to be interested in that. And um, the graph shows that. But if you also then look at Facebook families, 
and kaleidoscope creativity, which are typically not as culturally engaged. If you look at the purple um, blocks for them, they were really, really high. So I think what's interesting is thinking about whether there are some audiences that maybe you never really reached truly pre-COVID, but actually has digital engagement opened up opportunities which it, it would be worth investing in, continuing to invest in or starting to invest in, because that is a way for you to reach and connect with those audiences who might, for a whole range of reasons, not, not be able to or want to come and physically visit you. Um, also, the audience agency's digital survey, looking at you know, reasons why people engaged online, and that's really interesting, you know, things like boost my mood, reduce stress, anxiety. So again, if, if you have um, sort of audience engagement or development goals um, to do with well-being, for example, or if you're questioning why, why you might want to do digital engagement, then that's you know, quite useful research. And then there's also just broader stuff that goes beyond, the, beyond our sector, really. So things like even just keeping an eye out on um, YouGov or Ipsos Mori's polls on COVID-19. So currently, for example, um, they're tracking that the fear of catching COVID is going down. So again, when you're sort of thinking about reopening and planning and capacity and numbers and all those things, it might be um, worth just keeping an eye on that as well. So the third stage then is plan. Um, so thinking about who your audiences are, it is useful to segment them. So to group them and break them down into distinct groups that, like I sort of mentioned before, either behave in similar ways or have perhaps similar needs um, are likely to engage with you in similar ways. I think it's really interesting to think about whether your digital audiences are, your, are the same as your in-person audiences and what the implications of that might be for what you're doing. And I'll talk more about that in the next slide. Also, if you had a segmentation approach pre-COVID, you know, is that still valid? Do you want to revisit that? And thinking about how you might split your audiences. So um, the audience agency, you can use their audience spectrum model. There's also uh, Morris Hargreaves McIntyre. They have, I think it's called culture segments. That's their model. But you can also absolutely do your own. Um, you know, some organisations will think geographically, so they'll break their audiences into who lives in the local community, maybe particular postcode areas or within, especially if you're a local authority run museum, that might be your patch. And then thinking beyond day trippers to overnight people who stay overnight and international visitors, for example, you might want to think about demographics, whether that's um, age or family life cycle stage, um, thinking about disabilities, ethnicities, uh, behavioral, so how people behave either in terms of how and when they visit you. So are they regular visitors, sporadic? Are they lapsed visitors? Or how they behave when they actually visit your museum? So do they um, browse? Is it a surface visit? Are they there for the whole day? Or psychographic segmentation, which um, sort of covers things like values and attitudes. So even now, you know, you can think about would it make sense to split audiences not along, for example, ages, but thinking about the likelihood that they're going to return this year because of COVID. So just as an example, um, thinking about who your audiences are, comparing them sort of pre-COVID and now, this is just a made-up example where pre-COVID, these were the main audience groups that a museum had. So local families with primary school aged children, local people who are typically sort of over 50, um, primary schools across the county, and also they had uh, partnerships with some international language schools, so they had groups of language school students um, visit them regularly. So thinking then about now who has become a virtual audience over the past year and maybe who hasn't because they just want to stay as an in-person audience, so plotting that. So for example, local families uh, might have done both. So they were in-person audiences and they were also happy um, to some extent to engage with you virtually as well. Similarly, local people. But perhaps despite your best efforts, you found that actually primary schools in the county just haven't, there hasn't been any uptake. They haven't wanted to engage with you virtually, for example. And the international language school students, 
are doing neither. They're not physically in the locality and the only reason they engaged with you was as part of the course they were doing. So they've sort of been crossed off the list. But perhaps then you have noticed that some new audiences have started to engage with you. I think one of the ones I've heard a lot from museums, especially local interest museums, are that people from much, much further afield than would normally follow them on social media or certainly attend a talk or a workshop or something have been starting to follow them on social media and, and um, attend and listen to virtual talks and presentations and so on. Um, so, for example, people who maybe grew up in a particular area, moved away, they have been keen to rediscover and reconnect with the local area, or perhaps um, they have relatives who grew up there and they have some form of connection there. Similarly, sort of special interest museums have, a lot of them have been able to really connect with people from much, much further afield. And then just thinking about, so when, depends what you call these audiences, but if you're thinking about, say, in person versus not in person, maybe virtual, um, which ones then are, can you engage with digitally and which ones non-digitally? So which ones would you find, need to find other means to engage with? So also part of the planning, you might want to set some audience development goals. And I'll just talk you through a few examples um, based on the goals that the audience agency um, have suggested. They've got a guide to writing an audience development plan. It's linked at the bottom of the slide and also in the resources. There's also a couple of success guides um, on audiences um, from AIM, the Association of Independent Museums. They're also linked in the handout. So again, um, you could also kind of work your way through those. I've added a couple to these though because I thought a couple were missing. So um, in terms of different types of goals, you can think about reach. So extending your reach, really thinking about increasing the number of people you engage. You can think about social audience development goals. So this might be you identify specific communities, you want to diversify your audience, perhaps um, have more audiences who are less likely to be engaged, you know, really thinking about overcoming the barriers that those people face. Um, educational audience development goals. So this could be providing learning opportunities, particular learning outcomes, informal learning, formal learning, you know, across the ages, experiential audience development goals. Um, and I think this one can often be forgotten, actually, because we're so, we can become a bit obsessed with numbers, but, you know, really thinking about also the experience. It isn't just about the number of people who engage with us. It is also about, I suppose, the experience they have and how you can improve that or enrich that. So how can you develop audiences' experience and engagement and, and build deeper relationships with audiences and improve the quality of their experience. Um, you, you know, you might want to think about existing audiences, how can you make, you know, encourage them to become repeat audiences or more frequently um, come and visit you. Uh, or you might also want to think about um, memberships and friends schemes and involvement at that level, or even, you know, people who are really interested in your organization, if they might want to become volunteers as well. There's also reputational and creative audience development goals, um, which are slightly more relevant to arts organisations, but I think you could also apply this to museums and heritage organisations. So thinking about building audiences for particular types of work or exhibitions, perhaps, or events, um, and sort of gaining credibility and recognition for, you know, particular type of work, basically. Um, collaborative ventures, so finding partners that you can um, do projects with. And then lastly, financial. Um, for some organisations, they don't like to sit financial goals under audience development. They will sit that under another plan. So that's totally up to you. Um, but obviously, you know, increasing developing income from ticket sales, from secondary spend, memberships, donations, online programmes. It's all worth considering. So I think when you're planning your audience engagement or if you're writing an audience development plan, just have those in mind and maybe just flick through them and think, okay, what's important to us? Which ones are relevant to us? So just a few examples then in terms of setting goals and objectives. So goals are typically something, a desired result you want to achieve, typically over a slightly longer time period and might not be quite so specific, might be a bit broader. So 
they should definitely, everything you do should support your organisations, whether it's a business plan, a forward plan, mission, vision, that sort of thing, and be based on research findings. So in terms of you've identified um, a need and you want to plug it, for example. So some examples of audience development goals might be to increase our local family audiences, um, to develop, so that's more of a, a reach one, um, to develop an online learning workshop offer for early years settings, for example, that might be more of an education one or a social one, um, to build partnerships with three new community organisations, which is maybe more of a reputational um, one. So if you set some goals, you might also want to break them down and for each goal have one to a number of objectives that will help, help you meet the goal and um, just be KPIs essentially or targets. So ideally, you know, they should be smart. So you want them to be specific, some detail in, measurable, um, so that you can you know whether or not you've met them. You want them to be achievable. So a bit of a stretch and a bit of ambition, um, but still realistic. Um, like I said, realistic and also time frame. So you'd um, specify when you would um, deliver them. So just um, as an example, then the, the top one to increase our local family audiences, what might objectives look like for that? It might be that you decide, right, let's have an objective. We don't know that much about those audiences. So maybe you want to run two focus groups with parents and carers by May 2021 in order to identify what their perceptions are of us and what their needs are. So maybe that's one of the objectives first is to actually just gather more data. Um, you might want to set an objective that is specifically looking at some programming, so to run five drop-in family workshops in the school summer holiday, at least 25 families attending each, for example. Um, also, then you might want to set an objective that you want to increase your repeat family visitors by 10% um, and increase the number of family memberships you sell, for example. So, you know, for each goal, there's a whole range of objectives you could set um, that will support that goal. So then you've kind of done your research and you've got your plan of action, hopefully, um, which you can then flesh out a bit more once you have those objectives. So like on the last slide, you know, those objectives will really um, give you a good steer about um, what activity you should be doing in order to meet those. So, you know, consider then, do you need to undertake more research consultation? Do you need to write, revisit, redevelop an audience development plan? Do you need to set any goals and objectives? Do you need to decide which audiences you're going to prioritise sort of more strategically, develop particular programming for them? And then this sort of question about whether to keep providing and or introduce digital or online activities later this year and in a sort of post-COVID world. And typically in sort of your action plan, you might want to include what you're going to do and who for, um, some realistic timescales, any budget and resources that are needed, also responsibility, you know, who is taking this on, anyone in particular need to sign it off, and then how you will monitor and evaluate that activity. So I know some of you have probably done a lot of digital engagement over the last year, maybe some of you haven't. Um, so it's worth thinking about what, what has worked over the last year, you know, can you, do some light evaluation on that and for what audiences. There's obviously a lot of data you can get from analytics, but also, you know, have you asked your audiences for feedback? And then thinking about, is this something you're going to continue with as this kind of hybrid model of engagement, perhaps because you know it reached audiences that you never could have reached in other capacities. So there was someone who came to the session yesterday, for example, who said that some of their online talks were attended by 400 people and they couldn't you know physically fit 400 people in a space for example so they were saying that yes they would seek to keep going with some of that because they just know they can reach um, a bigger number and range of people through that and um, potentially also some additional income generation so if you are going to keep doing it you know what purpose is it going to have is it just as a sort of complement to your um, physical visits and physical engagement just to remind audiences about you while they can't visit? Is it to grow new audiences and encourage them to come? Is, is it just about directing people to your venue or is it to reach audiences who will never physically come to you? 
um, or something else or a combination of them. So, you know, if you're going to carry on with your digital engagement, I just think it's worth taking a step back and thinking about the purpose. And also then how you can make whatever approach you decide to do as inclusive as possible. Um, so this is some research that if you are considering whether to take on, develop digital engagement, um, this research might be um, useful to you. So it's from the Insights Alliance, which is a group of three um, agencies who pool their research, Baker Richards, um, Indigo and uh, one further. So again, this is ongoing, they're doing sort of several waves, but just a few screenshots again, just to give you a flavour of the sort of data they have. <coughs> Excuse me. On the left, you'll see um, a graph, how interested are you in engaging with culture online in the future? And they've broken that down um, by age. So you can see that younger people, sort of under, um, under 35, then 35 to 44, if you're looking at the dark block, very interested, and the sort of medium blue block, interested. So there is um, definitely a bit of a sort of um, tendency for younger people to be a bit more interested in engaging with culture online in the future. But the numbers are still quite heavy. And if you, um, healthy, sorry, for all age groups, you know, it's it's only really, I mean, what we're looking at the top there, sort of a third who are saying not interested at all or not really interested. Um, there is a block there in the middle that, neutral so they could potentially be convinced. Interestingly at the bottom what would be your attitude to attending or visiting the cultural organization in person as a result of watching or taking part in this online experience? Um, about a third said it would make them more likely to visit but 60% said it made no difference so that's quite interesting and um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think you could argue that different ways so you could say well Either that's a good thing because we're not then cannibalizing, you know, from our physical visits by providing digital engagement, or you could say, well, actually, if your purpose is to drive visits, um, maybe the third isn't high enough. But I think those numbers will be quite um, different for different types of activities and digital engagement and organizations as well. Um, and then the one on the right, which of the following would most closely describe your attitude to online culture once you are attending a suitable variety of live performances in person? slightly more aims at performing arts venues um but it's it's still interesting so you know again some people which isn't massively changing the sort of pale block on the left they're probably not going to engage with online events or activities the big purple block less likely to engage but would still consider it and then um the two blue ones will engage online um a good sort of fifth a quarter saying they'd pay for events online and the sort of bright blue one there, eight, nine percent saying only for free content. I think the interesting thing about this is that even though I imagine all those people are answering those questions truthfully, um, those attitudes might really change and they probably don't know how they're going to feel, um, you know, in a few months down the line. So then the final um, step of the framework, which is evaluate. So just making sure that you're keeping track of what you're doing. Um, you don't want to be wasting your time if you realise sort of 12 months down the line and um, that something's not working. If you've got those smart audience development objectives in place, that makes um, the monitoring and evaluation a lot easier when you come to it. Definitely consider how you're going to monitor and evaluate everything you do at the outset rather than suddenly thinking about it right at the end. Um, if you're doing things like asking visitors to pre-book, and obviously, if they're booking um, for things you're doing online, you know, how can you make the most of that data? Are there additional questions you can ask um, just to get some additional insights? Um, you know, focus on evaluating key areas that are really important to, to your organisation or you or your team, your department, rather than everything. So, you know, what are the metrics that really will make, se make sense, uh, make a difference to how you do things that you need for your reporting? whatever that is and then share the results and act on them so you know tell other people who've been involved congratulate them thank them um, learn from things that have gone both wrong and have gone right and I just wanted to spend um, the second half of the session sharing a few practical examples um, that I've come across that I really like so just a few online examples um, and this I think is just to 
I suppose, hopefully give a bit of inspiration and just share just a real absolute range of things that people have been doing and organisations have been doing um, across the board for different types of audiences and sort of different levels of depth of engagement. So, for example, um, I know a lot of organisations have put on online educational resources for families. Um, so this was the Fitzwilliam Museum in um, Cambridge, their Look, Think, Do, um, which was just really lovely how they sort of tied in. They've got um, a Monet um, painting in their collection that's on the right, uh, the Lion Rock, and they use that as inspiration for creating a story which they then shared on YouTube, a uh, screen grabber, which is on the left, um, and had a range of activities which you can see on the right, look, think, do, and um, you know, some of them um, you didn't have to be sitting at a screen for, and I think that's what's nice about sort of some of the activities that have been going on where um, families can choose themselves, you, you know, do they want to engage with something online or actually do they want to be inspired by something and then take it um, offline. Um, so I mentioned it's sort of different types of depth and this is just a really simple but I think it can be really effective way of doing a bit of audience research that can genuinely feed into what you're doing. So um, simple social media polls, so Leeds Discovery Centre by doing, I'm not sure if they still are, a sort of object of the week um, and a, a little sort of five minute video about them. And then they did a poll, you know, what do you want next week's museum from home video to be? Um, rainforest or rocks and fossils? And I just think it's a really nice way of making your audiences feel like actually they can contribute a bit to what you're putting on for them. Um, and also, um, it's genuinely of interest to you because you're more likely then to be providing something that's of interest to them. So it doesn't have to be really onerous, you know, it can be something as, as simple as that. Um, a lot of museums have taken exhibitions online and, um, you know, with varying degrees of success and also sort of budgets and scale. So Museum of Cambridge is very small, um, largely volunteer run um, museum. Um, so last year they put their Arts in Prisons exhibition online um, and also tried to do some interactive things as well. So like a sort of Facebook um, live with an artist and so on around that as well. Again, um, something a bit more lighter touch perhaps. Um, just joining in with trends on social media. This, um, you know, might be just a way of increasing your followers and also just sort of maybe positioning you um, in a slightly different light. So anything from the how it started, how it's how it's going, um, friends from a few weeks ago, um, Yorkshire Museums um, ran curator battle um, with different themes like um, best museum farm, tremendous transport here and loads of others where museums could pull um, objects, photos of objects from their collections that matched those themes and shared and, you know, got really, really good um, Sort of engagement in terms of comments and and numbers sharing and i think um the um one of the comms team at yorkshire museums you know said it's been their most successful sort of marketing campaign ever in terms of the growth they've seen as a result um some of you might have come across the weetabix and baked beans um sort of story a couple of weeks ago and that's an example of the national railway museum jumping on that and on the right we've got um benny sanders mittens this was just to show it's quite interesting because there's so many different takes that you can do with sort of memes and trends on social media. So obviously a lot of people like the Ashmolean there um, put the Bernie Sanders sort of cut out in maybe um, their images of their museum spaces or galleries or from their collections. But even here, Aberdeen University Museum Special Collections, you know, they were inspired by it. So they linked the Bernie's mittens, but actually um, pulled out um, a, a glove, a mitten of their own from their collection. And um, this kind of audience participation interaction, I think, especially in lockdown one, um, when the provision of other things um, wasn't maybe as advanced. Um, so, for example, the Getty Museum challenge, challenging um, people to recreate um, artworks from their collections was quite fun to watch. I mean, some people really went to town on that. Um, this is just another quite simple um, example, but really effective. So the Cooper Gallery in Barnsley upload um, images um, of art from their collections and you can then 
do use them to do an online puzzle and you can pick which uh, image you want to do which artwork and the um, how difficult you want it to be I think this one was 100 pieces and then there's a like a timer so they have a little kind of online scoreboard so it can get a bit competitive and fun and um, you know even something sort of like that can be quite quite good fun um, Ashmolean Museum a bit like the Getty Museum Challenge so here um, they take um, have taken objects from their collections and then inspired people to create works of art off the back of that and there's just a few examples here of the variety they've had through um, really really great um, experience Barnsley their museum and discovery center again sort of lockdown one they recognized so they're sort of in tune with what people were doing and recognized that a lot of people were having a clear out of their loft and sort of tidy of their sort of home living spaces and was saying show us your stuff you know if you find something a bit weird funny old quirky take a picture and send to us and they have plans to um turn that into a digital exhibition afterwards um Nebworth house um commissioned um a freelancer to create these i think it was four or five sort of five minute time travel shows um which were really engaging and really it sort of felt actually even though they were quite low budget you know the production values weren't super glitzy they had quite just a very nice cbb's kind of cbbc feel to them um and yeah we're, re we're really nicely done um also just a reminder that you can kind of have fun with your brand and embed that in what you do as well so this is museum of english rural life the mall and these are just some screen grabs from their website when they first reopened so you know thinking about if you are encouraging people back or whatever messaging you have for your audiences how can you make it um less dry if appropriate you know sometimes you might need to keep it a bit safe um so follow the new one-way system keep an absolute unit of social distancing, um, give us a helping hand by washing yours. So they've got all the kind of um, COVID safety measures um, and messages in place um, and just highlighting them with images from their collections. Um, and I think it's also worth remembering volunteers. Some organisations treat volunteers sort of separately. Some might see them as part of, you know, as one of their audience segments effectively. Um, Greston Hall Museum and Workhouse um, in Norfolk did amazingly in terms of keeping the engagement going of their volunteers um, last year and in fact they grew their volunteer base by about 25% in the first few months of lockdown um, when I heard from a lot of other organisations that they sort of struggled to maintain um, contact with them um, and did, did all sorts of things, um, give them remote volunteering opportunities to do so things like um, improving postcard collections info, um, cataloguing archives, researching family history, also developing some future temporary exhibitions and community craft projects. Um, what was really nice as well that they recognised the, you know, one of the key reasons that volunteers um, volunteer is the social side. So they also set up um, Zoom sessions that were just about having a cup of tea and a chat with people. Um, so that, that was a really ni nice example from them as well. So before I move on to offline, is there, does anyone um, want to share anything they've done? Oh, Tilly, I've just seen to put great social media use by York Museums Trust, thread of objects in their collections relating to Bridgerton. Oh, nice. Really well done and got a good amount of attention. Yeah, York Museums Trust are, are, are doing great stuff on social media. Also, Egger Museum, actually, are really fun. Um, and Leeds. Um, there's some of the new ones to watch. I put a link in um, the hat, the resources um, to a blog, which is actually a presentation that Georgina Brooke gave um, last year at a conference when she was at National Museum Scotland about their um, content strategy for social media and how that developed um, over COVID, which is really interesting. So if, if kind of social media and digital engagement through that is something that you're interested in, then that's worth a quick read. She's got some really nice um, examples in that. So I think what's interesting with the sort of more offline um, examples of outreach um, of, of engagement that have happened the last year is that really commonly you'll see that museums have partnered up with community organisations on the ground in recognition that you know if you're trying to reach particular 
parts of your community that are often organizations that are already, you know, maybe charities that are already working in that space, who will, um, you know, you can work with um, a lot more successfully than if you're trying to do something on your own. I've just seen a message there from Rhiannon, thank you. At Sir John Soane's Museum, our youth panel created an intervention for the Architecture Drawing Prize exhibition and undertook email interviews that were published on our website. It presented a real opportunity for them to get more involved than they would have been typically. Well, that's a great example, thank you. And Francesca, we've struggled to keep our elderly and often not tech savvy volunteers engaged. Any tips? Yeah, this is what's interesting about Gresson Hall actually, because that's the experience that I have heard that most museums have had actually. Um, that's for various reasons, a lot of volunteers haven't wanted to engage digitally. Perhaps they can't or don't feel confident, but actually for quite a few I've heard that, you know, what they liked about volunteering was physically having a reason to get out the house and go to a space they really, really enjoyed being in um, and meeting other similar like-minded people and it's it's been really hard to replicate that online um i know the curator at thurrock museum um spent a lot of time she was individually writing letters to volunteers and phoning them um just to keep in touch with them and sort of keep checking in on their well-being um in the first lockdown is that anything that um anyone else has struggled with sort of keeping the elderly um, they're more elderly volunteers engaged and if anyone's got any tips on that. Definitely. And I suppose the hope is that that, like you say, with the schools having gone back, that that will ease uh, and won't last. I suppose it's otherwise whether, you know, what is the risk? Is the risk that if there isn't much engagement or communication with whoever those volunteers are over the next few weeks or months, will they drop off and the habit has broken and they will not return? Um, or will they be gagging to come back? It's just that the current circumstances just don't work for them. I think that's something that's quite interesting to think about. Um, I, mean, I think some, a few museums have been, I suppose it, it really depends on your setup and how many volunteers you have and how hyper-local they are, you know, have dropped off, dropped off physical packs of things so that maybe you meet slightly online, but there's still sort of physical tactile things to do um do at the same time that's interesting actually what you're saying Rhiannon about the younger people and I can I mean I've got two primary school age children I can totally um get that and I think also as parents you know if they've been online all day in front of the screen you're not really keen to encourage more of that even if it's for a different purpose No, that's brilliant. Thank you. And I think um, picking up on what Rhiannon was saying, I think it also it does come down to this idea of just really understanding your audiences and their motivations and their needs. So um, sort of all the data, for example, on digital exclusion, um, you know, we can think about that as sort of big sweeping generalisation. And yeah, typically, often it will be older people, certainly. Um, but, but there are very many reasons for digital exclusion so for some people it'll be the lack of devices for some people it'll be lack of data uh, mobile data which is expensive or poor wi-fi signal for example and then it might be also skills and it might be confidence and motivation so they're the sort of three main categories that um i've always seen come up when talking about digital exclusion so you know it's useful to understand what are the reasons so Rhiannon's identified okay it's actually it's not about skills and it's not necessarily about the lack of data and devices because that's the, you know the young people have that it, it's actually just that screen fatigue and kind of um online fatigue so um 
it's I think it's interesting to try to identify what the reasons are and then see what you can do about it. But then again, like Rhiannon said, you know, sometimes you have to accept that um, hopefully just temporarily this, you know, perhaps a limit to what you can do and then, you know, come back to it a bit further down the line. I think I've got a couple of examples of offline engagement um, with um, older members of the community, although not, not specifically volunteers. Um, I mean, this one's from Ipswich Museum, who partnered up with Volunteering Matters that um, works in the local community to distribute um, arts and crafts packs through them. So with um, the families they work with and through food banks. Um, similarly, again, and this is, you know, quite a nice idea that several Suffolk museums came together. So they provide various family activity packs and worksheets. Um, as a, as a sort of pack that then was distributed again to, to a lot of different families. Um, first site Art Gallery in Colchester. Um, last summer they provided free meals for families and um, free lunches in the summer holidays. And I just think that's such an incredible um, welcoming and inclusive thing to do um, and providing your space, you know, for the community. And first sight do you know really incredible work as part of their community. Um, this is quite interesting um, from Doncaster. Um, so they've been providing these packs, and I think they're quite substantial. I think they're about 28 pages with um, activities, um, sort of aimed, the sort of re reminiscence activities, um, which also have mindfulness things in them. So 60s inspired mindfulness, for example. Um, and again, recognizing, so they're hard copies, uh, activities packs that they're distributing. Um, through their social prescribing teams, um, but also, you know, recognising that not everyone has um, access to the internet, for example, they um, produced these um, Doncaster's five minute histories that they make available on CDs that people can listen to at the Museum of London. Um, they've also been doing some reminiscence activities. And again, both having packs online on their website um, that you can download or print out yourself and also hard copy packs that have been distributed. Um, what I really like is they've had a monthly chat with an artist and you can join in um, through Zoom, but you can also dial in just on a phone. So again, just kind of thinking about everything they're doing and making it as, as you know, sort of inclusive and as available to different types of people as possible. Um, this is an example from America that I just came across on Twitter and really like. So the Minnesota Historical Society partnering um, with a community centre and they um, I, I couldn't get a high resolution photo, but basically they've taken these wooden hearts to various points um, across their community and have sort of signs up. They have these pockets with pens and these wooden hearts and members of the community can take one and sort of write on it, draw on it and hang it up. Um, so just a really, you know, really lovely community activity. Um, this was also quite interesting. I came across earlier in lockdown one, the Lissa Art Museum in Holland. So you could sign up for to receive um, a free 10 minute phone call from it could be anyone from their gallery. It could be the director or curator, front of house volunteer, like absolutely anyone who would just sort of talk to you about one of their pieces of art that's in their collection. Um, you know, really, yeah, just a really lovely thing to do, quite evocative. I see quite a few uh, museums have been doing con contemporary collecting and that can be submitted digitally, but also people can, you know, send in things um, by snail mail. Uh, Museum of the Home makes total sense, you know, to be documenting um, and recording stories of home life under lockdown, for example. Um, and this, was pro this is a project between these museums and galleries and an arts organisation and older people support network, um, which has again, been looking at older people and the potential isolation they've been facing um, by staying at home. So they provided sort of hard copy activity packs um, with lots of creative ideas in them and links to the ornithology collections at the um, museum and sort of being encouraging participants to look out there, just look out their window from their home and seeing what birds they can spot and how they can identify them and that sort of thing. Um, and this one I just came across on a GISC mail. Um, so this was um, back in early autumn when things had slight, sort of slightly reopened. And um, this museum used a, they, they said they got a COVID-19 grant and just invested in 
um, some walkie talkies to allow them to do some sort of socially distanced guided tours around their town. Um, and they trialed them with some year five and six groups who really liked them because they felt like they were sort of spies who got to speak into walkie talkies and listen in walkie talkies. And it just enabled um, the museum to um, have different groups of people who could be socially distanced from the others and also hear more actually than, you know, often if you're doing um, a, a group tour sort of on around town, there's a lot of traffic and background noise. So actually it worked quite well for that about whether to return to cultural venues or not so that can be quite you know useful to look at what are the sort of key things so if you have to pre-book and if you have to pay a clear refund policy um, in case of cancellation is really important information provided set routes um, I mean ability to get there with limited contact with people outside my group during travel that's obviously something that you can't really do um, much about um, Time entry, I know most museums did last year. Um, so, you know, still a sizable pe percentage of people who have this point. COVID-19 safety measures don't have a negative impact on the experience I am used to. Um, and it's interesting, I did some um, evaluation of visitor surveys from a museum that was open last summer up till October. And what was really interesting was um, so many people put positive comments over the moon at that they were so grateful to have had the chance to go for a day out and feel safe and secure because they could pre-book they knew all the information was there at the same time the the largest number of negative comments was about the fact that their experience was limited because um they couldn't touch some of the objects or actually get into them that they had previously been any, allowed to do but overall, when we were tracking, because I've been working with that museum for sort of on and off for six to eight years, comparing to previous years, that overall satisfaction level for their visitors remained the same. So I think there's, you know, overall, perhaps there's a recognition, certainly from previous audiences who will know what they're missing out on. Obviously, new audiences won't because they won't have been to you before, that, that you know, maybe there are things that are a bit restrictive. But overall, on balance, certainly for that museum, it seemed like that didn't affect their overall um, enjoyment and satisfaction of the thing. Um, so the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions, ALVA, um, that looked at um, what, where the anxiety is. So um, sort of the, the um, screen grab on the top right, um, perhaps as we'd expect, interactive exhibits, visitors touch is quite high toilets high, although the minus numbers in the right hand, so minus 11 for toilets, show that that's, toilets aren't as big an anxiety area now as they were in July, for example. Um, audio guides, cafes, and so on. Um, so there's been sort of, visitors tend to feel less anxious on most things compared to last July, but certainly indoors there is more anxiety than outdoors. And this one I've included bottom left confidence around the use of public transport to travel to attractions has also increased amongst Londoners since August 2020. So that's interesting to look at as well, um, especially for those of you who are dependent on people using public transport to get to you. So last year there was the we're good to go, no before you go campaigns. It'll be interesting to see if that is um, sort of resuscitated, if there's a new campaign that um, venues can get involved with this year. I mentioned, you know, sharing pictures of your team and safety measures you've got in place to reassure people. Um, this is lovely from Cresswell Crags. This is Charlotte. Um, you know, you can see she's wearing um, a face shield. Um, Tester Zoo, I've just included as an example because I just think their FAQs, and here's just a snapshot, um, have been really comprehensive. Um, so many questions they really sort of thought of everything and you know asking things also about gift vouchers and is that still valid in my membership and um all sorts of things um really really useful so videos a lot of organizations did videos last year to um show people that they were reopening and how things were going to look um i think that can be really really good um different sort of levels of budget but i just think um these are some really nice examples. Historic Royal Palaces, yes, sort of bigger budget, and I think they used some drone footage. But what I liked about them and what I think why I've included it is because they had so many different members of staff involved 
each sort of saying a line in the script, you know, um, the chap here, but also I think there was a gardener, you know, maybe someone front of house, just it really showed that it was the whole team was on board with it. Making the most of good reviews, um, also encouraging visitors to leave good reviews. Um, last year, sort of, um, I think June time, I had a moment where I considered taking my children to Legoland, um, looked on TripAdvisor and very quickly decided not to based on the reviews um, that for my personal sort of level of risk and what I felt comfortable with were atrocious. But, you know, if you're able to provide a good experience, um, you know, do encourage um, reviews on TripAdvisor because people are looking at them um, and they're quite telling. Just share with you. So these are links to some additional resources that you'll get with the slide. So I just thought I'd highlight a few just so you can see what's coming. Um, I mentioned the guide to creating an audience development plan and also AIMS success guides that can be quite useful. Also flag up here some, you know, London Museum Development's YouTube um, channel. I'm always recommending to people even beyond London. There's loads of great videos on there. Um, digital divide and digital exclusion. If that's something that you're interested in, there's some links here that break down, you know, the types of exclusion and who who is excluded and in what way. So that can be some really useful um, data for you. And then here it looks quite intimidating, but hopefully you can just pick out things that um, resonated with you or interested you from the presentation. And these are just um, some of the surveys and research that's out there in the sector now and a few additional COVID-19 resources. So there's um, here the blog post by Georgina Brook I mentioned in the session, for example, also some bit about remembering and considering um, inclusivity and accessibility as well um, when we reopen.